welcome to Gardening Australia. Later, I'll be letting you in on a few secrets for attracting bees to your garden. But first, here's what's coming up on this week's show. Winter is a great time to get working, and today I'm going to show you how to divide and propagate some of my favourite productive plants so you can give a few away. Number 27 in this pleasant street in the Perth suburb of Wembley is rather greener than its neighbours. So much so that one impressed passerby liken the effect to a Persian carpet. You know water gardens are a fantastic complement to any home. So I'm going to show you how to create a most beautiful water feature by arranging aquatic plants in a large pot. Yeah. While you could say nearly all flowers will attract a bee, here's my tip. There are some plant families that bees will make a beeline to. So I'm down at my local nursery to share with you a few plants that you can grow to help get your patch buzzing. The daisy family provides an absolute smorgasbord for the bees. And what about the happiness they provide for your garden? You know, every time I see a daisy, I think of the games I used to play with my sisters. Loves me, loves me not, loves me, loves me not. And I love daisies. When you have a close look at the disc in the centre, it's actually made up of many, many, many flowers filled with nectar and pollen. That's why the bees love it. And look at all the different colours and selections. And there's plenty of varieties of natives to choose from as well. The aromatic mint family is perfect for bees. Now, of course, that includes lots of different species of mint, but include in that things like rosemary as a shrub and a bush. And then there's the salvias. Here we've got pineapple sage, but there's lots of others that I want to show you. There's plenty more salvias to choose from up here, but also in the mint family is the lavender, and then there's the basils. And out of all the basils, I reckon my favourite would have to be this one, bush basil, because it's so tough and it flowers across pretty much all of the year here where I live. The thing to remember about these plants is we want to pick species that are suited to our area, but also that flower across the months and across the season so that we provide the bees with flowers the whole time. Coriander, parsley, carrot, dill. They're all members of the carrot family. But the best part about them is harvest them till your heart's content. But if you want to help the bees out, leave a few to go to seed like this one and they create this wonderful thing called an umble, which is a flowering head full of nectar and pollen and the bees will have a festival. And you do nothing, yeah. just leave it. Bees prefer yellow and blue flowers, so make sure you factor those into your selection. The other thing is, when you start to plant from these plant families, not only will you attract the bees, but you'll also attract other beneficial insects that'll knock out things like aphids as an added bonus. And finally, take a pick, make some selections, and start to create a buzz around your neighbourhood. Well, the temperatures have definitely dropped. It's winter, but that doesn't mean you need to stay inside. It is the perfect time to be digging, dividing, propagating and sharing some of the best productive plants in the garden. And I'm going to show you how. The first thing I want to plant are some raspberries. Now, I manured this about a month ago. I'm just going to get it ready, dig it over. It should be perfect. Raspberries are absolutely one of the best berries you can grow in the home garden, particularly if you live in a cool or temperate climate. Now, this pot might not look much, but I promise you, I'm going to divide it up and I'm going to get lots of healthy plants. You can see that all these little bits of root are trying to make plants. They're desperate to get out of this pot. So I'm going to identify the biggest clumps and then split them into individuals. Make sure each of your individual plants has a little bit of root attached and drop them in a bucket of water to keep them hydrated so you're ready to plant. 
Now, they are suckering plants, which means in the garden they can get away, but here I'm going to plant them up against the driveway and behind them eventually will be some chooks, so I'm hoping that'll keep them in check. They're dead easy to plant. You really do just need to get them up to that level where the cane was in the ground. I'm going to put them about 30 centimetres apart and they should go great guns. <laughs> Rhubarb is another one of those really easy to grow perennial plants. Everyone should have it. From full sun through to quite deep shade, you can still get a really good crop out of them. And I've got a few varieties in my garden, but this one's an absolute standout. I don't know what it's called. It was given to me by another gardener a few years ago. It has fantastic colour. It's got really, really good flavour and it holds its stems quite a long way into winter. But now it's starting to slow down. So that's the perfect time for me to dig it up, divide and replant. So this is still quite a young plant, but you can see it's already developed a couple of distinct growing points, so they can be individual plants. Divide your clump using a really sharp spade and making sure you go vertical so you don't damage the growing points and you get a bit of root with each piece. So I've got a mixture of compost and cow manure and I'm going to dig it right in. I've got a couple of really nice pieces to replant and the important thing is, they're really easy, is just to make sure that this growing point is above the soil level. And the last piece, well, I'm going to give that away. The last little treasure I want to deal with today is this clump of perennial leeks. So I was given a couple of stringy leeks in some wet newspaper last year by a gardener with strict instructions, don't give them away too quickly, build up your stocks. So I planted them, they're starting to really multiply now underground, but I want to build up, I'm going to divide them further and then every one of these sort of finger thick little leeks will start to produce pups, so time to get that done. Just like planting spring onions, you just make a trench and then lie the seedlings down. You don't have to fuss around to get them upright because they'll actually do that themselves within a couple of weeks. And because they're alliums, are dusting a dolomite to sweeten the soil. So don't let the cold weather fool you. There is plenty to get done in winter. And by propagating a few plants now, you'll have plenty to share around. You know water gardens are a fantastic complement to any home. But of course, not all of us have the room to dedicate to such a large feature. So I'm going to show you how to create a most beautiful water feature by arranging aquatic plants in a large pot. But first of all, I have to decide which water plants to use. Aquatic plants fall into three groups. The first lot grow completely underwater, and they're the plants you use in aquariums. They're great for providing structure and shelter for fish or other aquatic animals. Well, I won't be using any of those in my water feature because we're not having fish. The second group of plants, however, they're plants that really like to have their roots submerged all the time, and I've chosen a few of those. This one is chafy sausage. Just look at that, it has these tall, elegant leaves. And I've chosen this because it'll contrast beautifully with anything I choose with a more rounded leaf, including some of the floating foliage. 
I'm going to add to that with this lovely yellow marsh flower. Now, this produces buttercup-like yellow flowers in the summer, and it really is quite a star. It's got quite rounded leaves, so they'll contrast beautifully with the vertical leaves of the sedge. And then, last of all, I've got a bit of Nardu. This has gorgeously shaped foliage. They're quite silvery when they're young, and the shape of these will be really attractive. They'll come just up above the top of the water surface. The third group of water plants are what are commonly known as bog plants. These don't want to have their roots permanently beneath water. They grow in the water margins in the mud. The first one of those I've got is the tassel cordrush. It's a gorgeous vertical leaf again. Really will provide quite a lovely feature. I've also got some mazus. Now, this forms a great little ground cover at the edge of the water. Really beautiful foliage, quite dense too, and it'll make a lovely layering ground cover plant. And the third of these, well, I reckon this is a cracker. This is Xerochrysum. It's a native daisy, producing those typical native daisy flowers. I'm going to grow these three plants in a separate pot where I can provide perfect conditions for them to do their best. Now, I'm going to start by potting up my plants that need their roots submerged. I've got an ordinary garden pot for that, because you're not going to see it. And into that, I'm going to put a heavy garden soil, a soil that's got a fair bit of clay through it. And open sand is really not the best for this. Into the bottom of the pot, I'm going to put a, just a little bit of newspaper. The idea of this is it'll let water through, but it'll prevent the soil from coming out of the holes in the bottom of the pot. I'm going to put all three into this one pot for now, and that means that I'll get really quite a nice display in the first year. It doesn't really matter how I put them. You want to think a little bit about how they're going to appear in the pot. I'd have the sedge at the back, where it's a little bit taller, and the smaller plants at the front. The other thing I've got to do, of course, is give them a little bit of fertiliser. Now, I don't want to use a fertiliser that's going to dissolve into the water, because then I may well have an algal problem. There are special aquatic fertilisers you can get from your local nursery. I'm just going to bury one of those down in the soil so that it'll be released into the soil as the plants need it. And that'll prevent it escaping into the water. And the last thing I've got is a nice pebble mulch. This will help stop the soil from uh, moving into the water and making it cloudy, and it'll be covered up by the water. All I need to do now is put that in my container. Now, for the bog plants, I'm not going to completely submerge the pot, so I've chosen a fairly robust and quite attractive pot. It doesn't really matter whether this one's porous, because, of course, these bog plants, they want the water running in and through them. I've probably put a bit too much soil in there, so just pull some out of the way, squeeze it in there, and that will grow away beautifully. So that can sit right in the front there. And I've really got a pretty complete pot. And that really is those plants pretty well potted in. I've got a lovely large pot here, but I will need to vary the depth of the water for my different sorts of plants. You can use anything like concrete blocks or old bricks, even inverted plastic pots if they're strong enough, or a terracotta pot to vary the level of water for your plants. These are the submerged plants, and they can sit in there like that. And the water's just coming over the brim of the pot. And these are my bog plants, which will sit a little bit out of the pot like that. It really looks fantastic, and it'll only get better as it matures. You know, with the vast range of pots and plants that are available, the opportunities with this are endless. Why don't you have a go yourself? I think it'll give you fantastic satisfaction. Well, after 17 years presenting with us on Gardening Australia, that was John's last story. So we've put together a little something to say goodbye. Ever dynamic, John has always been a man on the move who'll travel anyhow and anywhere to get a good story. Murphy and I like to get away a bit and visit beautiful gardens in other parts of the world. John has been telling us about good garden design since 2001. In this Eckersley garden, 
Each plant has been carefully chosen for its textural qualities and then massed so they make maximum impact in the garden. John's never been daunted by a spot of rain or a bit of Latin or Greek. Parthenocystis tricuspidata, Plethora phagesii from China, Crataegus finer pyrum. Now this one is Enchianthus perillatus. And he has a handy smattering of French. Et voila! From carte blanche to mour végétal. Oh, 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 such je ne sais quoi. John's always been gardening Australia's Renaissance man. There's his love of science. Here in my patch, I'm having thoughts a bit like those of young Albert Einstein. I'm contemplating space and time. Now, these leeks, for example, they've taken up a fair bit of space. Oh, well, they've taken quite a bit of time. And he's a history buff. In 1873, then curator of the gardens, William Guilfoyle, had a bluestone reservoir built to solve watering problems. He appreciates fine art and has a pretty good hand himself. But for me, I'm going to divide it up and have these four garden beds with the central feature. John has always said what must be said. Now, I must say, at first glance, this garden is not the most promising for a veggie patch. Now, I must say, looking down here, this looks to be pretty nice soil. Now, I must say, Andrew, I find this front garden particularly rewarding. If you want a piece of sculpture, buy a piece of sculpture. You're liking this because it's odd. Not... And isn't afraid to call it like he sees it. But I've got sick plants that look better than this. I mean, what on earth is it? Look at this. Isn't that vulgar, that big rhododendron? There's something smug about Magnolia stellata. But he can lend a sympathetic ear. And are there any things you would change? I'd probably make it bigger if my husband would open his checkbook. Yeah, OK. <laughs> and have a little fun along the way. Good evening, Australia. Hope you're ready, because it's time to rock. Well, there we are. A ring, I've given that a pretty good workout. <sighs> John's introduced us to luminaries of garden design. Patrick Blanc is the world's foremost designer of vertical gardens. Michael McCoy is a garden designer, author and passionate plantsman. And he's going to show me a garden he's created for a client in a rural area just outside Wood End. Paul Bangay is one of Australia's most renowned landscape designers. His beautiful and classically inspired gardens are celebrated here and overseas. John's always emphasised the importance of balance in design and showed us the good principles used in every size of garden, whether it be small and chic, medium-sized and marvellous, or grand and sublime. High on a windswept hill, in a bare cow paddock, a grand vision has been realised. By identifying what it is you really want from your garden and applying common sense, all of us can get more from our own little pieces of paradise. John, all of us here at Gardening Australia have benefited from your brilliant botanical knowledge, your design expertise and your sense of fun. Thanks so much for sharing all of that with us and we wish you well for everything you put your time and energy into in the future. I look forward to catching up somewhere, sometime, real soon in the garden.
I love to use recycled materials to make garden features or garden art, like this bike wheel arch. I sourced the bike wheels from the local salvage yards and I simply spray painted them and wired them onto a frame. It creates some colour and it's fun and low cost. And now it's positioned in my pumpkin patch and I'm so excited to see what it looks like with pumpkins growing up around it. Number 27 in this pleasant street in the Perth suburb of Wembley is rather greener than its neighbours. Rather more tropical too. Just look at these pawpaws. More citrusy. The lemons are here for neighbours to use. More succulent. And rather more colourfully annual. So much so that one impressed passerby likened the effect to a Persian carpet. Twenty-seven is like this because of Thomas Potter, a financial planner and, in his spare time, a cereal gardener. Or so his wife, Diana, says. Thomas? Thomas? Dear me. Thomas, never Tom, is 70, going on 20. He's brimming with energy and gardens for the sheer love of it. G'day, Thomas. G'day, Josh. How are you? I'm very well. Good to see you. Good. What an amazing garden you've got here. Bananas and all right out the front on the verge. Perfect spot. Perfect spot. In the sun. Fantastic. Yeah, so how long have you been working away on this property for? 20 years. 20 years we've been here. And uh, it, it, it was a desert when we came, and now it's all full of life and vigour. It's great. And it's non-stop for you, I hear. Non-stop. It keeps me out of mischief. Very good. This corner block has already been subdivided, leaving Thomas to make the most of a tiny backyard. It's cool, shady and perfect for a range of ferns, impatiens and begonias. We've had this trellis put along here with the plants, which then gives the effect of a green wall coming through. Certainly uh, does. And it spills over and the plants actually grow from one, one basket to the other uh, and it just fills in like a mesh. You really have squeezed a lot into it. Tight spot. Tight spot. But it was never going to be enough for Thomas Potter. Nor, in the end, was the front garden. So Thomas turned his attention to colonising the corner verge. And the result has been a multiple prize winner in the local council's annual garden competition. Well, you're a bit tight for space out the back, but you've made up for it out here, Thomas. Josh, we are, but we've used this space to incorporate it into the garden and, and, and expand it out. However, we have to follow the council rules, of course. And so we've incorporated in the whole structure of this streetscape part of the uh, footpath in lawn and then em embraced that with the garden strips on either side. That, of course, includes the lemon tree, which people come and use and pick. Uh, and enjoy, which becomes a great talking point as people go past. How about the importance of keeping a clear line of sight on the corner? Very important. This corner, in fact, was uh, a, a real problem from crashes at one time. They've changed the configuration of the signs, but it's important then, of course, to allow lines of sight so that we don't have any such problems. No, it really works, and it's lovely and full, and you've got a massive garden. We have. One thing Thomas and I agree on is that Perth has some of the most challenging gardening soils in the world. And a good way to address this is to bring in the worms. Thomas, what's your approach? Josh, I put a lot of manure on the garden, which we obviously put on the surface. And the need is then to bring that manure into the garden and into a depth of soil. And so I then dot my garden with a whole range of worm farms, similar to the one that we've got here, and, and I encourage the worms to come in by garden scraps, putting manure and other fertilisers in there, and they then create their own system and create a well of worms which then carry out into the garden and carry the fertiliser from the surface down to the roots of the plant. As our suburban blocks become smaller, it makes sense that we start to garden more seriously in our front yards and even spill out onto the verge. And it's great to see that more and more councils are beginning to support this. And Thomas Potter, well, he's leading the way. The 
end of another show. It goes quick, doesn't it? But you can stay in touch via Instagram, Facebook and our website and keep us up to date with what you're up to in your garden. In the meantime, let's have a look at what's on next week's show. I love to see bees on TV, but bees in my TV? Well, that's exactly what's happening because I'm converting my old TV into a bee hotel. I'm visiting a large-scale organic apple orchard to find out some of the tricks of the trade that can be applied at your place. Starting a garden from scratch, it's an exciting challenge, but to get it right, you need to do some site assessment and analysis. I'll show you how.